Daniel Hazen. Um, I have the opportunity to be the executive director with Voices of the Heart, uh, 10 miles from here in Glens Falls, New York. Prozac. Prosperidol. Clonopin. Lorazepam. I'm really excited. Um, I'm energized. Um, I'm nervous. Um, and I also feel uh, very liberated. Ambien. Thorazine. Seroquel. Nardal. Uh, this has been a dream for about a year and a half, two years, to be able to bring this together around this taboo subject of coming off the psychiatric drugs. I wanted to come to this training to be with my peers and to be open in a safe environment to talk about my experience with coming off of medication. I came to this training because I want to know how to safely come off from it. I've been off from I've been on psychiatric meds for about five years now, and I just want to be able to think more clearly and not be all drugged all the time. In June of 2012, 23 of us, a far majority either users or survivors of the psychiatric system, including many who had been given some of the most serious diagnoses, including schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, came together for three days to discuss a subject near and dear to each of us. Coming off drugs seems to be this uh, topic that people are afraid to talk about and at our organization where we work with many users and survivors of psychiatry, people um, come to us and talk about this. I came to this uh, training because I would like to be a better resource to people who would like to come off psychiatric drugs who are so often seen as adversarial when they try to do that. I came to this training because about 10 years ago psychiatric drugs nearly killed me and I pray every day that I can do something to help other people who want to get off of them. I wanted to come because I enjoy the truth. And what we realized is we didn't have the skills. We didn't have the, the support ability to wrap around people during this uh, experience. I came to this training because it's so easy to get on medication and so difficult to get off. Because I think it's pretty easy to come off drugs and just quit taking them, but it's really hard to stay off and maintain your own wellness while doing that. I came to this training to empower myself with more knowledge so I'm able to bring that to my community and help my peers in their quest to get off psychiatric drugs. I do want to thank everybody from coming from all over, from Oregon, Alaska, South Dakota, Massachusetts, Maryland, and New York City. I came to this training in part to overcome my despair about our drugged human family. I'm in the life work and mutual support, and I've been off my psychiatric drugs for two months now. I came to this training because I'm going off my medications and I want to help others go off theirs. And also to become a more skilled helper. I don't think there's any two better people that could come here, share their expertise around this, the many years of developing this, this guide, the many years of organizing, the many years of fighting for people's liberation and choices. So I want to uh, welcome Will and Oryx. I wanted to come to the training because um, it, coming off Psych drugs was a huge part of my own recovery. To share what I've learned about coming off medications because I see too many people are trying to come off medications on their own without support and without uh, good information. And to hopefully start a movement that's led from the ground up, which is the only way I think that real change is going to happen. In closing to that, I do consider this uh, historic. I don't know of uh, any place in what I call the consumer survivor expatient movement and what's now becoming a united movement around words such as mental diversity and recovery um, and human rights. Um, so I want to turn this over to uh, two great experts to uh, share with us um, this great opportunity around coming off psychiatric drugs. Although our gathering was formally defined as a training, we realized quickly, in the first hours, that it was much more than that. That it was a summit, or, as I felt inspired to call it, due to the wealth of knowledge in the room, a meeting of the minds. A lot of this workshop summit 
is asking you to participate. We're going to be asking you to talk about your experience and to do exercises and be involved, but everything is optional. And this is, of course, one of our key values. I've been on psychiatric meds for 26 years, and I'm experiencing some side effects, some undesirable side effects. So I, I'm looking forward to getting information on how I can get off. I just recently uh, came off the last psychiatric drug that I've been prescribed, but probably a 20-year, mm -hmm. uh, a 20-year stint, approximately, uh, of various medications. I've been very excited about coming here today because I'm all about giving people choices. We understand what happens when people are forced to do things that they don't want to do. That's happened so much in the mental health system. I was 17, I entered the system involuntarily and I turned 51 mm -hmm. a few weeks ago and uh, just came off of psychiatric drugs a couple of months ago. And I feel 17 um, in many ways and um, yeah. having 17 year old emotions and yeah. have a pimple. <laughs> uh, have spent the last year sort of, um, have sort of a, 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 sort of a love hate really, all that much more ambivalent, it may, may be a better way of saying it, with the psychiatric meds, and spent a, the last year sort of um, coming off um, uh, off some medications, and I'm still kind of ambivalent about that. I've been um, uh, uh, pretty much off them since December, and it's that hasn't been an easy road, and I'm still exploring that. I've been on psychiatric medications three different times in my life, and taken myself off three different times. I also work as a provider in the, uh, as a psychologist in the public mental health system in New York. The reason I'm here is because I'm seeking out places where I, that seem to be the most constructive ways of helping people. This definitely seems to be one of the approaches that it really needs to be part of our work with others. I came off of medications uh, back in September 2010 and it's given me a new life and I'm really, really passionate about helping others who want the same. I was on medications sporadically from age 14 to 18 and then from age 18 to 27 for um, bi a bipolar diagnosis um, that I left behind. I just want to recognize all the different roles in the room because all of us have different relationships to psychiatric medications. There's people who are on psychiatric medication here. There are people who maybe come off medication, people who are in the process of coming off, maybe people maybe never have taken medications. There are family members, uh, professionals, activists, advocates. I was a therapist in New York for 10 years, and a lot of my practice was helping people uh, come off psychiatric drugs safely. And it was a constant issue, something I heard about every day. I actually have never been on psychiatric meds, and um, the, the main reason for that is because of the peer movement. It's sort of swooped in right when I was getting a huge amount of pressure from therapists and from my partner at the time. I actually wanted to make a film with Will oh, about three years ago on coming off psychiatric drugs and the timing wasn't quite right and it turns out like three years later they were going to do this training and they told me about it and it's just like, I, I thought I actually wasn't going to do any more films. I hadn't, I hadn't taken up this camera in a year and a half and suddenly it's like, this struck me as, this is, this is something that's really important. And I started becoming a part of the Freedom Center and uh, by proxy the RLC and then um, doing, you know, alternative practices like yoga and meditation and um, I had a lot of peer support and saved my life. Although some of us felt we'd been helped by the mental health system, and even at times by medication, many of us had been harmed by mental health professionals in positions of power and authority. Because of that, we felt that a discussion on the subject of expertise was vital to any serious exploration of coming off psychiatric drugs. Within the word expert is the word experience. So, well, I mean, yeah, they're similar words basically from the same root. So I think that you can only be an expert on something if you have experience with it. There doesn't seem to be as much care as I wish there were with how we feel. We're the best, we're the best experts on how our brains and, and bodies feel. I think there's a clinical bias when you use 
the experts and doctors. I, I believe they've worked in the medical model so long that they can't see past the medication. My daughter is in medical school and went through a psychiatry round. And when I encouraged her to read Anatomy of an Epidemic, she said, you know, we've got to get this information into the students because by the time we get out of medical school, we're, I don't think she said brainwashed, but something sim similar to that. Any conversation you have with most of them is a bias that will, you know, don't step away from your medication. From what I've read, 80% of people who are prescribed psychiatric meds go off or stop taking it within two years. Mm -hmm. uh, I've seen that statistic mm -hmm. thrown around. Sitting with doctors who are trying to figure out how to taper it, I say, why not get the people who have done it? I mean, how can you guide if you don't know? And in my experience of working in the mental health system, there's very few doctors who will support a person's decision to want to go off by providing meetings or family meetings or suggesting alternative ways of coping with stress that may come up. Um, you know, so there's just a huge void. I, I see this so much about knowledge and the creation of knowledge and who is disseminating the knowledge. And so much of the knowledge that currently exists in the medical world is false. So I was just having this fantasy that you guys would be teaching, you know, the, the doctors, because they don't know. They don't know. The doctor's a so-called expert, but not really. Because who really knows what's going on with these medications, just what's been uncovered. We're the expert, even if people don't perceive that we are, we don't think that we are. I'm not aware of any MDs are willing to step up and, and talk about this mm -hmm. and say that this needs to become part of our medical practice. It's really important to point out that people are already coming off. And yeah. that statistic is that's primarily the antidepressants and anti-anxiety drugs. So we should remember that people are already coming off these drugs and there's a bias in the science and so anytime you have a liberation movement you're also having to challenge the science and the medicine there was an upheaval in gay men's health there was an upheaval in the feminist movement around women's health so we're just basically doing the same thing also i just want to say this is this is already happening in every other area of medicine one of the number one google searches is for personal health information people are getting second opinions they're learning things themselves they're educating themselves they're questioning their doctors. They're forming a more collaborative relationship. That's all we're doing here is the same thing. But because of the stigma and the bias and the oppression, somehow we're seen as not capable or we shouldn't have the same rights to that kind of medical collaboration as anybody else in society. When Will Hall mentioned the subject of stigma and bias in society, my mind traveled back three years to my initial attempt at this film project, when I spent a winter afternoon and evening in New York's Washington Square Park studying the public's perception of psychiatric drugs. Now it seemed that a sampling of that footage might be particularly relevant. When you hear the word psychiatric medication, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Mental patients, <laughs> like straight jackets, that sort of thing, violent images. Drooling, lithium, uh, Adderall. Crazy people. Honestly, I think crazy. Prozac, antidepressant commercials. Medication that helps people with psychiatric issues, that helps, you know, any kind of chemical imbalance in the brain. I have uh, positive feelings for it. Psychiatric medication is whack. I mean, take it from me. I'm, I'm a medical student. I'm my last year of medical school. So for me, I see them as a very productive and positive, um, I guess, yeah, I mean, when I hear it, I think of, of something that can really help people. As a youth, I got in trouble and this and that, so I was put inside of a group home. I'm out of North Carolina. And instead of um, going to the core... Schizophrenia, people who really need help. When I talked to my um, problems with the psych, he'd say, well, oh, well, this is what's wrong with him. We're going to put him on um, Haldol, Prolixin, or Thorazine. I actually have ADD, so I was put on Ritalin when I was eight years old. It, if used appropriately, it, it's a very valid modality of treatment. Uh, yeah, I was on it for about eight years. Uh, restoring chemical imbalances and, you know, getting people back in line. You know, it affects how you interact with people, so I think um, maybe relationships would be improved. No, I don't really like trust psychiatrists anymore after that because like, they always just kept trying to give me more medication. What they do is give these kids 
medication when all the kids need is attention. They weren't really listening to me or my issues. I, I tried like Ritalin, Concerta, Adderall, and like all these things, and certain things actually made me like depressed as a 10-year-old. It's lousy. I don't recommend it for no one. The only danger is if it's being used inappropriately by someone who's not thorough and competent. If, 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 the, uh, if dispensed or prescribed by a, a competent, uh, responsible psychiatrist or psychopharmacologist, there, there should be minimal risks. This is very interesting that you're asking me this right now. My roommate actually um, just got off his medication and was actually in a psychiatric ward last week because he was having withdrawals. You're talking to a mental health practitioner. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there were a lot of mood swings going on when I went off of Ritalin, like for good. Like I just, my body had to kind of get used to it, and you know, I ate more. I was able to get off of it. Um, I don't think I need them, but um, the way that the world is, I mean, I think everybody is crazy. I just think that if if there is an opportunity to not go on medication, I think that's the best way to go. Because what's crazy is a person that's misunderstood, and if you don't understand it, then it's crazy to a person that don't understand it. Everybody just needs love and attention, and that'll make this world a better place. Returning to the training, we next moved into the subject of collaboration with prescribers such as psychiatrists, which many people have found key to their success at coming off psych drugs. However, we knew going into it that this topic was sensitive and walked a fine line between the practical and the profoundly philosophical. For collaborating with providers, a really important thing is to win their trust. When they, when they feel like they can really trust the person that they're with, sitting there that I think a lot of uh, psychiatrists especially, they're willing to do things that otherwise would be risky if they know that the person with them is uh, agreeing with them on some things. I like what you talked about trust, Daniel, and I know for myself trying to as much as possible develop a trusting relationship you know, with the psychiatrist. Uh, sometimes it's not always on both ends, but the more you get to know them and the more that relationship develops, you can come in with a plan. A lot of the people that came to me had tried and failed repeatedly with psychiatrists to get anywhere. And what I found was that if they could use me as an intermediary, yeah. I could approach a psychiatrist from a very different angle and the psychiatrist didn't feel as threatened. And a lot of times I could do some of the work that was a lot harder for someone when it was like, when there was a lot more for them riding on it. For me, I could schmooze with a psychiatrist and talk their language a yeah. little bit, and they would soften. A lot of the people who've never taken people off meds were sometimes willing to try. So sometimes they will, they will soften and they will open. And there's gonna be other times, if I kept getting that same reaction, I would just try and find a different prescriber. But especially if you're locked into a situation where you have to stay with that prescriber, then do your best you can to really present a really good, solid, case and then offer to have them talk to another and family member professional. Call too. And family someone, they, else, someone else calling on a person they, they, have, they often be very excited. they love it they love it if family members are on the same page. If the family members are non confrontational. Mm -hmm. If the family member is saying, read Robert Whitaker and you know challenging, you've got to look at the studies and they they often see the family as also the problem. Yeah, it just feels um, important to you know to keep piggybacking on the uh, point of um, the approach to the uh, psychiatrist to not attack them. I want to agree with what Daniel and others said about the other provider because I worked with, I think primary care is an important partner. Um, my primary care doctor was one of the first to casually say, do you think you might be able to make it without medication? My primary care doctor didn't know me as long as my psychiatrist, but nonetheless was very um, open about just raising the question and then because of that I put them together they're in different facilities. Also nurse practitioners can prescribe primary physicians can prescribe in Oregon and maybe other states naturopathic doctors can prescribe. I used a primary care physician who was helping me withdraw and he basically was just a, typ a typical, he's a nice guy, a typical primary care physician who just doesn't have much time for anything or anyone so he just didn't care that much. I mean he, he basically, you know, said I could withdraw and sort of left me to my own devices for the most part. But my therapist at the time saw that I was struggling a lot and she just called him 
just to let her know that she was working with me. And I feel like that did make a difference in how he treated me. Like, it, he, he treated me more respectfully. As a therapist writing letters for people, because yeah. sometimes yeah. you call a psychiatrist, all you get is an answer yeah. machine, you yeah. never call back. Yeah. So to give the person a letter saying, they attend, I mean, it sounds horrible to say it sounds very medical, but it's just, I would speak the language of the psychiatrist, say, this person has been regularly attending their therapy, they're doing really well, they're doing all these different things for their life improvement, I put it on my letterhead, say they come twice a week, they've been coming for this amount of time, they're totally reliable, and they are interested in reducing medication, and I would have my clients come back and tell me, they'd be like, the psychiatrist read it, and I know what to say sometimes. They said they would just, it, it, like what you said, Hiya, the psychiatrist would often behave very differently mm -hmm. after that, much more respectful. Something, I don't know why, something about this has, isn't sitting right with me, and I feel like um, maybe it's because I've been spending a lot of time recently talking about the idea of collaboration and shared decision making and all of these things, but I think acknowledging that, um, to me at least, the idea of collaboration implies that there are two experts in the relationship, and to me, like the only expert is the person. That phrase of shared decision making points to how we still agree to be infantilized so often, and yeah, we just really. accept that, yeah. okay, it's time for our shared decision making when the person, in fact, can lead that shared decision making. I don't think in any other area of medicine do they say this your medical treatments are a shared decision. No, it's the patient's decision. Except with children. For children. I was first medicated as a minor. I had no choice. If I said no, and by the way, I used to chew up Thorazine pills that looked like M&M's. I thought they were M&M's. They're that light brown color. They still are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. God. Look like greasy species. Yeah, and they were disgusting. Um, but and spit them back out, and then I would get the shots, which felt like molasses, by the way. Um, at any rate, um, I'm so sorry that you take that, but. As a minor, you're not deciding. I just want to, I wanted to support Laura. I don't like um, shared decision making. Mm -hmm. It's like this new American practice and language and manipulative kind of practice. And in the international community and many other cultures, they're practicing what's called supported decision making. And it's, it is a different balance. It, it, it is uh, supporting each other in decisions that we make that we choose um, or want to explore. I want to challenge people to get rid of the shared decision making. I have a lot of comrades who use that language and I just completely disagree. I will never share my decisions. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> why, is it, why is it that you would want to collaborate with your prescriber? Why would you want to collaborate to begin with. The big reason I can think of that you don't want to, you know, go on your own sometimes is you, they will label you with non-compliance. I've been a product of that. The first couple times I tried to come off meds, my provider said, you know, you go off your meds, we're going to have a pickup order on you. And I basically told them some not so nice words and <laughs> went off my meds anyway. Police are at my door. might have some information that's useful to you. They might not, but they might have some information that's useful to you. Sometimes people have asked me, well, can I just cut my pill in, in quarters? And I'm like, I don't know what that coating is. Right. How the hell do I know? I don't, I don't know how it's been designed. I don't, I don't know chemically. You cut it open, and the next thing you know, you're getting four days dose in, in an hour. They can change your prescription. Maybe you need smaller pills. Maybe you need a liquid form. Maybe they can talk with you about switching the pills that you're doing. Because like that, that's somebody you pay for their advice, but you're free to take it or leave it. And, and, and so it's, it, I don't have to collaborate with my consultant. I pay them for information. They give me information. I like it. I don't like it. Hire them, fire them, whatever. But it's, it's right. pretty free to use that. The collaboration with the prescriber is a means to an end. So if they can help you get to certain things that you need in the coming off process, and if they can't help you get to those means, then by, you don't need to collaborate with them. You don't need them. You can do it on your own, or you can do it with a different person. Since most people who want to come off their psychiatric drugs agree that their drugs are not helping them optimally, 
This brings up the subject of what we ourselves can do to improve and maintain our own mental health. And so we tackled the question in a group brainstorming effort. So what we're going to do now is brainstorm alternative wellness practices and we're going to give it groups of three. Try to come up with a, a, a list so you can report back to the rest of Brainstorming, okay. so, um, Meditation? That's great. You know, the thing that I do most is, is listening to understand, non-judgmental listening to whatever's happening inside of me. Kind of sort of like radical self-acceptance. For me, running. Sure. I play golf. Excellent. Um, uh, broccoli. <laughs> broccoli. Healthy diet, does that work? Yeah. yeah. If I don't, yeah, if I don't attend to that, actually, I, I don't get anywhere. Getting a good night's sleep. Movies. Animals. Pets. Reading my Bible. Playing guitar. Ah, great. Yeah, favorite music is a good one. Facebook. Yeah, Skype is another one. Hiking. Nature. Sitting by the water. Peer support is one. Peer support. Root beer with ice cream. Reminding myself of my values. Journaling. Yeah. Positive affirmation. Reading detective novels. Riding memoirs. Stretching. Working in the garden. Yeah, I do that too. Learning something new. I mean, work for me is yeah, a really, that's great. really important one. Sort yeah. of like meaningful work or something. Yeah, work, meaningful work. Yeah, totally. Woohoo! Good. Yeah. nourish our bodies, bicycling, aromatherapy, breathing practices. We are very cohesive. Morning practices and, you know, our daily rituals and such. And physical sensations of touch, like for um, children or animals was one of the ones that came up. Being in nature. Reflexology. Reading. The hot baths. Hot baths. <laughs> Lavender and bubbles. <laughs> <laughs> Sleeping. <laughs> Is it? And then for the younger generations, the internet. Cooking, spending time with your children. Going to museums, that just popped into my head. I like to do that sometimes. So, what group? Actually, movies is missing. Oh, look, look. I don't think I heard movies. Yeah, movies. Horseback riding. Horseback riding. Crying. Crying. Nice. Yeah. Crying. Yeah. Hobbies and crafts. Creativity. Reiki, a long time, swimming, talking to people. Hang on, I think I missed swimming. Sorry, we're going a little fast. <laughs> <laughs> Faster. A long time. Star or moon gazing. Oh. I know I like to go stare at the moon. I like to stare at the moon for three or four hours at a time. Meditation, exercise, pets, music, journaling, meaningful work, radical self-acceptance, not self-acceptance, radical. Radical self-acceptance. <laughs> That's what it takes. Yes. <laughs> really, the point of this is there's just like an unlimited amount of wellness practices that we have available to us, but when you go to the hospital, you're not told, hey, this can actually work. As we got into the heart of the training, we began to examine in more depth what actually has worked for people. We used Will Hall's Harm Reduction Guide to Coming Off Psychiatric Drugs as a framework for our study, but we used our own experience to bring it to life. Cultivating support. I, I found this so important in my own journey of coming off um, to get the support of my family and to help educate them <laughs> about the research involved, it could be friends, it could be peers, it could be a doctor, if you have a supportive doctor. But people have done this without support. People have done this completely on their own, with no support, and not even telling anybody they were doing it. What I did just happened to work. I wouldn't recommend to anybody what I did. If you look at this last paragraph, the leading UK charity mind in their study on coming out of psychiatric drugs 
found that people who came off their drugs against their doctor's advice were as likely to succeed as those whose doctors agreed they should come off. I ran out of the prescription of my lithium one day. I knew for two weeks it was going to happen, but I dug in my heels and I was on a therapeutic dose one day, and the next I wasn't. So, this myth that you need to have a doc, you have to have a doctor's support, is really a myth. You can do it without a doctor. And when I had a rough spot, that I thought I was going rudderless again, I said, I think I really need some, maybe not a full therapeutic dose, but I need access to lithium. And I didn't have access to a provider at that time. My center manager, she said, you know, you can do that, but keep going with these other things. The results that they collected with interviewing a lot of people are showing that you're just as likely to come off successfully without a psychiatrist as with one. Yeah. And that that's like, that's, so contrary to like the medical advice. Uh, it's uh, like saying medical advice is just as good as no uh, medical advice. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's more like no, no medical advice is better than bad medical advice. <laughs> right. Yeah, because it seems like the doctors a lot of times don't really have much medical well, advice to give about coming off. Yeah, they're trained to get people on meds but not get off. They put obstacles up. For me, when I was coming off psych drugs, and even when I was on them, I felt that um, a lot of times I actually needed to be alone and I really needed a lot of privacy and I got pathologized a lot for being introverted and wanting to spend a lot of time by myself. So I know that peer support is really helpful for many people and it was for me too, but, but I think it's important to respect people who want to be alone sometimes when they're going off of drugs. Um, it's, it's kind of, I felt that having a lot of time to myself actually was really healing for me. Usually it's better to go slow and taper gradually. And again, this isn't cut and pass. Some people have cold turkey and done that successfully. We don't recommend that, but some people do it. Recommend um, starting with one drug. Maybe choose the one that has the worst negative effects, the drug you feel is least necessary. So we'll do one at a time. Make a plan. The 10% method is pretty common, which is uh, reducing by 10% every two or three weeks. It could be longer if you've been on the drug longer. And also just about that, that frequently people find that at the end of their withdrawal process, they need to slow way down. That they can't, they just seem to really slow that because that's when it's the hardest, mm -hmm. sometimes. You don't always know what's going to happen when you do something. And if you do know what's going to happen, then we probably wouldn't be sitting here. And, um, and I think that's both scary as hell and exciting as hell. I just want to add one thing, and this really comes back to the harm reduction approach, is that you have to be flexible with your goal. You have to be flexible with your goal. You may say, I'm going to be off my lithium by the end of the year, and you hit an incredibly difficult period of your life with withdrawal symptoms, and you're sick, and you just and you realize, wait a second, I, I need to change my goal. I, I think it's important for people to know that um, if you try and it doesn't work for you the first time, that you didn't fail. And I work with a lot of people who are just very dead set and committed to coming completely off medications, and maybe their brain has been injured by the medications that they're on. Maybe they have chemical changes in their body. Maybe they don't have the supports that they need, and they may need to reevaluate that goal in the process as you discover what's going to work best for you. I think that's important to know that uh, in my experience, it took me quite a few times, uh, quite a few attempts. The real goal here is to feel more empowered and more healthy and more confident around your medication decisions. If you can do that, then you're successful. So let's not measure the success ultimately about whether I completely came off or not, because that, that potentially can set yourself up to not being flexible when you need to be flexible. And uh, there were times when it didn't work, when I had to go back on. And I felt I was a failure, that I failed at this, and uh, that that's not true. One thing that maybe we should touch on at least is when you come off that feeling, strong feelings can come up. And how do we how do we deal with these some of these strong feelings? Mm -hmm.
The issue of strong feelings is that I also didn't know what would come up when I came off of meds until mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So even with all that therapy, which was really helpful, there were a lot of things I didn't look at, which are now saying, hello, you didn't, not bad you didn't look at it, but here it is. I see here the 10% plan. That seems sort of arbitrary. I, I understand it as being the way to organize tapering off. I'm thinking about when I go back to the clubhouse, I'm going to want to explain what is the reasoning behind some of these methods. There have been studies on slow tapering being supported scientifically, but mostly that 10% rule of thumb comes from thousands and thousands of people doing it over the years since the 70s. But at the same time, everybody who promotes it says, this is not for everybody. Right. Trust your own experience. Because I mean, there are doctors that will take people off 50% two weeks, and then you're off in four weeks. And sometimes that works for people. You're also in a hospital when it's happening. And so if there's a problem, they're right there. I remember sitting next to David Cohn one time, and he said, it, we're finding that it really should be much slower than anybody's doing it. That was his, his thing. He said it. In his experience, it's looking like a year for every year you were on the drug. That, yeah. But that's so uh, different than some people's experience. I think about it in terms of just the basic idea of what withdrawal is. Withdrawal is your brain slowly readjusting to not having a drug. So, for example, if you are a regular drinker of strong coffee and you cold turkey off of the coffee, what's going to happen? You have a strong headache. If you slowly taper your dosage of caffeine down, maybe the headaches won't be as bad. So it's a similar kind of adjustment of your brain and body to not having as much of a daily input of a drug. Although we all came for the formal training, it was inevitable that a big part of the value in our three days together would take place in our unstructured time. As a sample of that, let us jump into an average dinner conversation which, invariably, strayed quite a ways off the beaten track of average. I feel very protective of people feeling judged because they continue to take medications, because I see that happen a lot. I see people who've come off medications and who say we're very pro-choice, we really respect people, but there's a judgment in the background. And I'm just not going to step no, into like someone's art. life and say, well, oh, oh, I know better for you, you than you do. Because the person that I'm with um, <laughs> may be suffering and dealing with things around medications that I've never <laughs> experienced before. If a person chooses to stay on medications, like, I completely respect that. But if a person wants to come off of medications but is, is convinced and believes for whatever reason that, that they can't, I want to do whatever I can to help that person give it a shot. I think a good way to frame it is I believe it's possible that you can get off your medication. I believe it's possible. And it's not about can or can. It's let's see what happens. Let's try it. We were all told that it was impossible to live without medications. Now all of us are living without medications. So the reality is that people don't know. People are a huge mystery. I think there's a difference between someone not wanting to come off of meds and someone wanting to come off of meds but not thinking they can. If someone's like, I want to come off but I can't. That, that I would say, yeah, what did you try? You probably didn't try, you didn't try X, Y, and Z. You probably mm -hmm. didn't do it. Let me help you. Let me support you. I don't believe that that's true. You're predicting your own future. Exactly. I think and, it's yeah. possible. And it's so completely based in fear because deciding to come off of psych meds was the scariest thing I ever decided to do because I, I didn't know who I was off of meds. I'd been on meds for 10 years. I had no idea what feelings were mine, what thoughts were mine. I had no idea what my personality was like. And so all of those games I played in my head about you can't do this, you're not going to, it was all based in fear. And once I acknowledged that fear and owned it and started talking about it for what it was, it was fear of the future, fear of the unknown, fear of myself, of my authentic self. Once I acknowledged the fear, I could coexist with it and, and, and do it. Right on. Every day I woke up over the last year, I didn't, I didn't think I was going to wake up. I was, I'm, I'm still being driven by fear, by the way. I'm still afraid, and I'm working on it. Afraid of? A lot of things. Well, I say I'm getting stronger every day, I know that, but there is some fear that I have, and I'm working on it, and I don't know exactly what it is yet, but... 
poetry and other things are kind of leading me in a direction of greater understanding. And I'm going to continue to, to journal even though I was actually afraid to write anything down. I started, I have started, but I stopped and it's been fits and starts. And now I actually typed on my computer while I was here, mm -hmm. kind of a beginning of a story. Owning that fear is so important yeah, because... Figuring out what it is is going to take me some time and it was so humbling to hear that people need a couple of years. People said it's been a couple of years, it's yeah. been, I've also been... It needs a couple of years to come off to and get, feel okay again? Yeah, but you know, I may never know what what's behind everything, but I do know that every day that I'm living is is a day that's for the future. You know, every day is, I mean, it's just been amazing. I've been getting involved in Buddhism and write, reading and, and I've just reading a whole lot of other things besides mental health. And I've read that some of the more well-known Zen masters, including Siddhartha, that was six or seven or eight or nine years before they became awakened or enlightened, or before they had an opening to have greater understanding about themselves. So, and I see that number six to ten or so, and it's kind of like, it's like three months for me, you know, and I'm going, oh, but that's good. It takes longer. Yeah, you know I think I mean? that analogy is really great because I see my experience coming off meds as, as an enlightenment, as an awakening of sorts. Yeah, I and, it an awakening. And the more, the more I felt feelings, especially fear, but anger, grief, all, I mean, all of these feelings, the more, the more I allowed myself to feel them, the more human I felt. And the more you know, grateful I was that I got to feel real feelings that, that were mine. They weren't coming from the meds. They weren't coming, they, they weren't side effects. They, they were my feelings. And even if they were painful feelings, I got to own them and be with them and get through them and, and like build up resiliency and confidence in myself that like I can feel these feelings well, and I'm not thing, gonna... One thing that I wanted to ask you, by the way, because you've been going through this longer than I have, is that sometimes I feel like I can break a wall that I want to. I want to, and I know I will break my hand if I do. I want to just hit it once. Or I want to scream in an airport terminal. I don't. Mm -hmm. So what I'm, what I'm wondering, and I, I have a lot of anger that I need to let out, um, but I know not to inappropriately, but when did you learn, when did you figure out, when did you do that? Did you do it at night? Did you do it in a field? Did you... When, when do you know, because like I'm doing mine, like I cried out here earlier, um, and it's a deep, I've wailed in my gut, I feel it. Um, I mean, I think it's different for everyone, yeah. um, so I don't think there's one right answer to it. I mean, I know, I think most of my feeling process I've gone through these last almost two years um, off of meds has been with people. Um, because I was alone for so many years, isolated in my head, feeling misunderstood, whatever it was. For me, my recovery process from psych meds has been about connecting to, to people, even people who haven't been through it themselves, but who unconditionally love me. Also to, to just, because I was so, it was so ingrained in me to pathologize myself and to pathologize what I was feeling, that it took me a while to realize that if I wail in public, and if people are going to judge me and call me mentally ill and call me crazy, like that's their problem. Of course there are situations where your rights can be taken away and you can be locked up if you are in a sure. setting and that happens, but you know, I've definitely yeah. behaved in ways that like are outbursts of some, and you know what, like I own it because I'm a fucking human and like that hap it happens. Yeah. As the conversation progressed, I found myself wondering how Ed, the psychologist from New York City, was fitting into the training. I know that it can often be difficult, or even more than difficult, for clinicians to integrate themselves into groups of psychiatric survivors, and I looked for an opportunity to ask him how his integration process was unfolding. Somebody really wise said this to me while I was coming off psychiatric drugs, because um, I was really impatient. I mean, how can you not be? Um, and, and they said, um, I want my life back, I want it now. 
Yeah. yeah. And I mean, I, it took only took me less than a year. Like some people, as we're saying, takes like so much longer than that. But somebody told me this Zen story of somebody asking their Zen master to teach them something. And the master says, okay, it's going to take about three years. And the person says, the disciple says, well, what if I try really, really hard? And the master says, well, then it'll take about 20 years. <laughs> and like, I have to say that that story actually comforted me while I was coming off of psychiatric drugs. It, it took away some of that sense of like, okay, if I just work really hard at this, then I can do it. So I got a question for you, Ed. I, I thought you really would say. What's that? Go ahead. Go, yeah, I'd love so, to have a question. So I'm curious, how, what's your experience of hearing all this? <laughs> um... I mean, it's interesting being a clinician and coming here because, I mean, there are parallels to my experience being working in the mental health system and trying to help people because in so many ways I don't have a voice where I feel like I can express my ideas and they can be heard without being shut down, without being criticized, without being told I'm naive, I'm stupid, you don't know what the hell you're talking about. If I express you're dangerous. What, I'm dangerous. If I, if I express what I really think, in a true sense, I mean, I do feel like I'm gonna, I would be, I'd be rejected, I'd be outcast, you know? But at the same time, you know, I mean, I have to say, like, at a recent treatment team meeting, someone, a psychiatrist there, was just saying, like, he's 18, like, this kid's he already had two breaks, you know, he wants to get off his meds, he's just gonna have to get sick again, you know, it's the only way, then he'll come back, maybe he'll get some insight into his illness. And I was just like fuming. <laughs> so the other social worker saw it and she's like, what's going on at? And I was just like, listen, like this kid's 18. There's plenty of people who get out of the mental health system and do fine, who do well. You know, the, in the long term, a lot of people do better without medications, you know, and I'm just sick of all this pessimism around this. And, you know, and we're here to help this kid. Like, you know, this kid can have a life. He's 18. We don't even know the context of why he even ended up in the hospital. Maybe his family's abusing him. I just went off for like, five minutes and then everyone was quiet and the meeting ended and then the next day the psychiatrist I work with was with the assistant director of the training clinic and we were talking and he walked up and he said you know what I really love this guy pointing to you yeah he pointed to me he's like I really love this guy but you know what because he's not pessimistic he actually believes people can change he's like it's great he's like we need more of that around here and I was just like holy shit that happened like a month ago. That's so interesting, though, is that your concerns are the same as mine. I sense your hesitancy and in concern what? about where you are with this and yeah, maybe yeah, yeah. professional issues, too. I'm still too. coming out. I'm in the and, coming out and process. And same with me. I have, I have the same, mm -hmm. not exact concerns, but I'm worried. I'm concerned. Are people going to think differently? Am I going to be accepted? Um, only I'm going through the experience and you're on the other side as a provider. And so it's it's like there's the strands parallels. of commonality yeah, no, definitely. of worry. I see it in your eyes that I have too. And it's uh -huh. like this, you know, you know what I mean? It's very interesting. It's a scary world. I don't know. Uh, little kids. <laughs> All right, I'm going to go, um, can I get a ride with you? Can I get a ride with you? Yeah. Okay. So, so Ed, yeah. how was that? How was what? Shocking, seeing what you said. It was great. I love it. Well, I think what you said was very valued. Valued by oh, all yeah. others. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't even know what I. I mean, I don't know. If, well, <laughs> you're saying what everyone else said, just in your own, in, from your own perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. That's what I feel like. Yeah. Like I have everything being said here. I can resonate with, but it's from the perspective of a, a clinician and of someone who works in the system and is going through s similar, not as severe, but similar uh, oppressive practices and losing their, their voice, mm -hmm. not being able to ex express themselves because they're being shut down. I, I, yeah, you know. I could not work in a hospital like you do. I think it would just yeah. eat me alive. Yeah, I'm do able you know? to tolerate. I've always been a mediator. I mean, that's my, 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 that was my role in my family. And part of me wants to be there. I have to be there. So part of me feels like I need to be there. In if I'm hospital. not there, who's going to be there? You know, and I, and if, if I'm not there, who's there? What's going on if I'm not there? When I worked on an inpatient, like my presence, I helped people, save people from being put in restraints because I was there to like mediate. You know, I was there to stop 
the order from the med coming in from inside the glass and be like, no, this person is just crying. Let me sit with them for a half hour. You know, I was there helping someone who heard, someone came in the first episode of Voices and got them to calm down and help them walking with them up and down the unit, you know, and residents coming up to me and be like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm helping them get through their first voice hearing. And they wanted to talk to me. I talked to them about it. You know, I have all these positive experiences of helping make change happen in mm. these environments. Just you know, a very, a very difficult to environment. A hospital. All those things have happened with, you know, do I do things every day at times I feel bad about and feel like I'm a sellout and I should get the fuck out and what's wrong with me and I can't believe I'm doing this? All those thoughts go through my head when I came up here. Hell yeah. I mean, you know, it's both sides. I mean, it's just it's complex. As we return to the training, we address the subject of sleep, which is so commonly a front and center issue for people coming off psychiatric drugs. Will and Oryx pointed out how good sleep, and sometimes a lot of it, can be vital for helping naturally restore a sense of inner balance, yet they also noted how lack of sleep can uncenter people like almost nothing else to the point of inducing psychosis. When people go into the hospital, and they come down out of their extreme states, what really is helping them? Well, they're helping them to sleep. I mean, they're knocking, knocking them out with heavy medications, but the big thing is that they're really interrupting their crisis with, with sleep. So this is a really important skill to have. When someone can't sleep, what are you going to do to help them? So speaking from my own experience, because I, I do have trouble sleeping, yeah. and knowing that I was coming here, I packed uh, a little fan because yeah. I need two things. I need air moving in the room, and I need a little white noise. <laughs> I turn the fan on in my room, and I have it pointed at the wall just for the white noise, or else I wouldn't right. be able to sleep. That's great. So a fan and white noise, yeah. Melatonin in those ever so precious hot yeah. lavender bubble baths. The ones that I'm thinking of are Avoiding caffeine. I would say also avoiding stressful conversations, or s stressful interactions, especially in the afternoon and evening. So by the time evening comes around, I'm down and I do that. I schedule like my difficult calls. Like I know it's going to be a difficult conversation. I won't have it too close to bedtime. Getting good exercise also I think can help me sleep a lot better. Gentle, good, healthy exercise, but. Um, not too close to going to sleep. Yeah, earlier. I was taking clonopin for a while for, for sleep. And I slowly weaned off of it, very slowly. And then for a while, I would just have it on my bedside. It would just be there. It was kind of like some type of placebo or something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just realizing it was there if I needed it. And if I had it there, I, I, never, I never took it. I would sleep just with the comfort that it was there. And then eventually, I. I didn't need it at all. I haven't done that in wow. years and years. I was on medications for sleep for 10 years, and when I came off of all of my medications, um, sleep was my, one of my biggest concerns. And and what I did when I when I couldn't sleep was was pay like sit down and understand why. And, and it wasn't that I wasn't tired. It really was that my head was going a million miles a minute. I think in large part due to the withdrawal, but other things too. And so what I did, and I did this for several months, um, was I just would put my laptop in bed with me and watch like South Park or Law and & Order. And just, and I needed, it, I, it's kind of similar to so the white alive. noise, but I needed something yeah. to, to get me out of the dialogue in my head. Yeah. And, and yeah, it took me many, many, many months to like wean myself off of that, but yeah, I think like, I was, it wasn't that I wasn't tired, it really was just that my head was going. Not eating too late for me, eight yeah. o'clock's about the cutoff, yeah. and then not eating too much. I wish we had siestas here. I can't nap. Napping, I have no self-control. Two o'clock in the afternoon, I wake up at seven. So, so I'll put napping or not napping. Yeah. yeah. Meditation mm. is actually, I'm really struggling with that right now, but I hear and was doing, I was meditating three or four times a day. I hear it's very good before bed. 
I think also, if you have something to look forward to, the next day. Acupuncture, too. Acupuncture, yeah. yeah. I don't know if that was that. Someone said chamomile. Yeah, there's a bunch of herbs. Chamomile, skull cap. Cap. Still choose uh, little benzo and definitely Benadryl every night for sleep because I still, uh, I've gone on and off with that, but I've been a period on. Journaling or talking to someone if there's something bothering me, so that I can't go to sleep unless I can. Yeah. The other thing is that it's really good if someone can't get to sleep, and this ties in with what was talked about at the beginning about reducing the fear that surrounds it, like I've got to get to sleep, I've got to get to sleep, is just to tell people that it's okay just to rest. Yeah. Just sit quietly, okay. sit in a chair, listen to some music, just be still and rest. You don't have to go to sleep. I didn't want to leave the training without getting a chance to interview the Ladner brothers, who had flown all the way to upstate New York from Anchorage, Alaska. Spencer, age 24, had been provisionally diagnosed with schizophrenia at 19 and put on a variety of antipsychotics and then lithium, and his family were crucial to his success at coming off them. When I went off with the doctor the first time off Cyprexa, it took like six months, but I don't really remember any like strongly debilitating side effects from coming off of it. Other than like I remember every like every time my dose was lowered, things would become a little bit clearer and I could remember like more of my experience and and process like new information better. But I don't really, really remember any strong side effects from coming off as much as I remember the strong side effects of being on it and just like feeling really empty and complacent and like you can feel all the nerves and capillaries on the outside of your face and you can't and you can feel your brain but you don't feel like everything else is connected. Yeah there'd, there'd be times of sitting at the dinner table with Spencer when he was on meds and you'd ask him a question and he would just sit there and stare at you you know and just look at you for like 10 seconds and then finally respond like there was just really slowed down Spencer, you know. Really? So he was really too drugged? Oh yeah, big yeah. time. So the first time I tried lithium, I felt amazing, you know. I, I said it was like baby ecstasy. Yeah. And you know, you just feel like, well, I'm gonna have to immediately sit down and relax and fall asleep. And so it helped me to start stabilizing my sleep. But I had noticed that every morning I'd wake up really, really groggy and really, really pissed off. It's sort of like some sort of lithium hangover. But I was doing well and I was confident that I was working with my, or my, I was working with my doctor as well, and I felt like I had a lot more strategies because me and my dad were active in maintaining that I would ride my bicycle all the time, and we would try and stay busy, stay busy and stay active. And like my dad's like, no, we're going to the grocery store. Like you're not gonna do anything here. You're gonna sit in the backyard. You know, you're gonna smoke a cigarette and read a book, but you can't do that the rest of your life. So we'd go to the grocery store. We'd go on bike rides. What was it like to watch him come back to his normal self? It was awesome. I mean, there was a lot of times where he would be not wanting to do stuff and staying home, you know, being afraid of, you know, whatever he was afraid of. And we had both sides where, you know, our mom was kind of like, you know, that I felt like she was more willing to allow you to just kind of stay and do what you wanted to do and not be busy where our dad was, you know, very... Like, you gotta get out there and do stuff. So me and my dad would ride my bike. We ride our bicycles all day and try and eat healthier and be productive and get out in the sun. But after that, I, I was living with a bunch of buddies. I was actually one of three people in a living room. So a three bedroom house with six people in it. Sleeping in a little like closet that just had a blanket for a wall. Yeah, and so that was kind of counterintuitive because I had realized by this point that I definitely had to get my sleep every day. But this lithium, though, was giving me a lot of issues, dietary issues. So I would drink like a gallon of water a day. And I would still end up puking every morning, this giant salty foam every day. And I was like, well, if I'm going to wake up with a hangover and I'm going to puke every morning, then what's the point? Because my number one issue is sleep. And I have to get my sleep. And so if my pill's going to fuck with my sleep, I'm done with it. I had already read the harm reduction guide and I started rereading the harm reduction guide and I started really thinking about what I could do and so I started slowly kind of tapering myself off. During all of this time, I wasn't really knowledgeable of meds and what they really did or nothing like that. My whole role was to pretty much just be there with Spencer 
and you know to assure him that everything's okay and you know no one's out to get him so I didn't really understand at that time what was going on and that he had you know this whole process of getting off his medications I mean that might that was obviously something I knew but it's nothing to the knowledge I have now it's nothing that clicked back then I was aware of him getting better and you know maybe some fallbacks and every now and then but I did not associate that with the medication necessarily at the time it's like getting off any other drug you know it's just you kind of feel groggy and you kind of have to get over that. That's, that's really what it came down to. At this point, I found myself curious to know what Spencer found most helpful to him during his coming off process, considering he's been entirely off psych drugs for more than two years with no returns to the hospital. For me, it's like I have to get my sleep at least eight hours. Very adamant on getting sleep. I, I, What's he like? Can you tell me? When he doesn't get sleep, he's a jerk. He's very grumpy. One of the biggest things I would say is that we as a family learned that the hospital was more difficult than anything, including the meds. Just the sheer fact of being surrounded by a bunch of people who I don't know and I don't identify with. Mm. And so for me, it was really important because my family decided collectively that I can't go to the hospital, because if I go to the hospital, they're always going to have to deal with three more months of me getting over the hospital experience versus the one or two months of me getting over my difficult feelings. And I, th I think what you know helps a lot in the work that I do now is having that experience you know, of a family member going through that. It changed our whole family dynamic because I was, you know, like I was in that place and they were all there for me. And so I could definitely wait on both of my brothers for me to be in a mental hospital. And you guys seemed like you were concerned for your own well-being and what does your future present to you? Right. Which I got caught up in the whole system of feeling that, you know, something is wrong with me pretty much because of what happened to him. You know, just reevaluating myself and thinking something's wrong with me that I need meds. So I got into this whole, you know, just hoopla of being on meds. And, you got on them too then? Yeah. I've, I've been on my wide <laughs> variety of meds and... You got off the stuff too? I was kind of stupid and cold turkeyed off of everything. And I was on uh, lithium myself after seeing what it did for him, thinking that that was helpful. I was on antidepressants, amphetamine salts, and I had cold turkeyed off of everything. <sighs> Which is stupid, I think, because even, you know, it's been a year and I feel like my brain is still fried. Like, I'm unable to be the person that I was before I got on meds. You know, I feel a lack of emotions. And... The other thing was, like, finding cathartic releases, you know, and, like, things to, like, you know, because feel angry and deal with the sadness of, you know, it's like I felt like four years of my life was just cloudy, and I don't remember many bits and pieces of it other than, you know, a lot of, like, people looking the other way or me being this weird, big-bearded mental patient to standard society so I started playing music with my friend and so really loud angry music and being able to scream and express how I feel and know how I feel and be able to be in contact with how angry I really am about some things and the melancholy I feel over like losing portions of my life. Now? Hell no. <laughs> do you see him that way? <laughs> I don't see him as a mental patient, no. How do you see him? I see him as someone who went through struggles of, you know, altered perceptions and someone who really took the effort to gain the knowledge about what was going on and to move through it without just re-going through the system and re-going through that cycle. I just see him as my brother. Why I don't see him as no mental patient. <laughs> Thank you.
As we jumped back into the end of the training, we found the group discussing one final subject, withdrawal, which plays a powerful role in many people's coming off process. Although some people, especially those only on the drugs a short time, experience little or no withdrawal when coming off, others can experience reactions, including supersensitivity psychoses, that are more extreme than anything they lived through before they first took psychiatric drugs. I think people should be aware that some, some things can happen, some difficult things. And anybody might also want to say that, or this won't happen. This won't happen. It could happen, but it could not happen. So to have an open an openness about it. Luckily, I went slow enough, and I hadn't been on long enough, I don't think, that I, I never had any really any withdrawal effects. But I'm sure lots of people in this room have had some pretty severe withdrawal. I've done really well getting off the Zoloft. But when I, uh, I was taking my tramadol to negate some of that physical effect of coming off it, I ran out of my tramadol, it was ticks and everything, I was doing this. Like, and many times I think people jump back on their medications because they can't cross that bridge. I just wanted to add to that how we deal with the physical effects over time of having, of the damage that the meds have done to us. So if anyone has ideas about, because even 10 years later, I still feel physical damage. The most important thing for me to move through, especially the acute withdrawal in the beginning, was finding meaning in, the, in what I was feeling. And I like, would visualize like, the acute withdrawal I had. I mean, I had the, that horrible like, fuzziness and electricity through my body. I had migraines. I had weird smells coming out of my body. I mean, I just was sitting here, I wrote down a list of some of the things. And it was scary, it was confusing, it was scary, it was agonizing, but when I started to visualize it as representing my body healing itself, like this agony that I'm in is action. My body is taking action to heal itself. And it's it's like, it that like gave me this determination to just keep going through it. Anything that, that we do for our wellness in general to deal with anxiety or restlessness or sleep, all those wellness tools that we have are also useful in the withdrawal process. And being patient, having somebody who's there to say, look, time is on your side here. Let's see if the withdrawal doesn't subside if you wait. And then sometimes that's what people find is that they are going a little bit too fast, that maybe they need to start back up on their dosage and go a little bit more slowly if the withdrawal symptoms aren't tolerable. Like everything else we've been talking about, it's very individual. So some people will be able to handle the physical pain, I don't want to say better, but it won't affect them as much or they'll, they'll be able to move through it and other people will just be excruciating. And I still today, almost like almost two years off, I still have withdrawal effects, but I'm at peace with them. And I have faith that, that they'll get better in time. And this is really where we can help each other because different people have found things about different kinds of supplements, like GABA or fish oil or vitamin B or amino acids. And a lot of that, well, it's hard to say, is it placebo, is it actually effective, but that's where we need each other because the research isn't being Done. I remember feeling uh, thumping pains in my abdomen, and I knew it was toxicity, and it was painful, it was, it was annoying as well, um, and uh, I remember I, was, I came off drugs, psych drugs, inside of prison, so there's not very many holistic uh, <laughs> opportunities there, um, and so uh, a friend of mine, who uh, Junebug was his nickname, and we'd walk around the yard. Um, which was exercise for us to move that toxicity, that poisoning, but I went to, I'd had my family and send packages of herbal teas. And I remember trying to flush my system. I remember the pain lessening over time and the thumping lessening over time. You can get a few vitamins and I just decided that I had to do this. And another thing I did was I began to run around the yard. You can just run and keep running in circles and I, the sweat, I just, this is just stuff I felt in, in my soul, that the toxicity was moving out of my body as I weaned myself off the Zyprexa and Depakote and Selexa. It was now time to say our goodbyes, and because we had opened up a taboo subject and revealed ourselves deeply, we had bonded. 
and so we found that a few closing words were in order. I'm grateful for all the love I received from the people in this room and the training. It made me feel comfortable enough to uh, really do some deep sharing. I'm grateful for all of your stories because it's the evidence that it's possible to come off psych drugs. I'm grateful for everybody who's here because I've only known not even a handful of people have gone off their meds. And I'm in the process of doing it, and I know it can be done. And I've been more encouraged about it and more reinforced about it by hearing everybody's story here. I'm grateful for the information that's been provided because many people come to me and ask me questions about how to reduce or come off their medications, and it's been difficult for me to find information to give them. It's really wonderful to be able to be to be able to say, "Gosh, I'm doing this thing, and it's really, really hard." And it's, it's really, really difficult, it's really, really challenging, but, it, but it's also moving in the direction of my truth. So even though it's hard and difficult and painful, I still want to do it. I'm grateful for the dark times in my life just as well as I'm grateful for the good times in my life. Mm -hmm. Because what I have found somewhere along the line, the horrible things that I've experienced, someone crosses my life who needs that experience that I've gone through to help them to get through and that helps carry me through. There were times in my life when I didn't think I could do it. I didn't think I could be in this world. And I really have a lot of gratitude for all of you for being part of that vision that, that those of us who've been told that we're sick or we're crazy or there's something wrong with us, that we're not, we're human beings too. So. I'm, I'm thankful for all the testimonies and I'll remember you when I'm going through my experience trying to get off uh, just being here feels like my past and my future are kind of like coming together into this integration. And I'm just grateful that we've got the right people here. We have it all going on and just that I have that confidence that wherever we try to take this, the answers will come. There's people like this all over the place and we can come together and start to build this. And how I view this right now is we have a bunch of bricks on the ground and we're just starting to cement and build our foundation. And it's going to continue. We're just going to build it. We're going to build it in our communities, and we're going to build it throughout the country and, and elsewhere. Thank you to all of you. And if anyone has, yeah, if anyone has anything they'd like to say or share, I'm going to start crying. <laughs>
Thank you.